Hey, Marvel movie rumors. That should help distract us from living in literal hell for between six and ten minutes. So, absent much else going on in this specific section of the filmmaking universe as the world continues showing surprising patience with the United States trying to get rid of at least one or both of its global economy stalling viral infections, the latest gossip surrounds actor Jonathan Majors apparently having been cast in a major Marvel Cinematic Universe multi-film role set to debut in a soon-to-shoot Ant-Man 3, once again directed by Peyton Reed. Good actor, happy to hear he may have picked up a big recurring pot. The hot gossip, however, concerns the rumored but not yet confirmed identity of the actual character, with Deadline.com reporting sources close to the project believe he's playing long-standing Marvel villain Kang the Conqueror. Who? All right, so yeah, this is an episode I was kind of hoping I wouldn't ever have to actually do because the whole explaining comic book bullshit before they make it into a movie thing is kind of the obligatory lifeblood of this business and still explaining Kang is just kind of a gigantic pain in the ass because while he's one of those big cosmic ultra threat bad guys who's generally the linchpin of big long-term Marvel stories, i.e. he could either be the next Thanos or they want fans to think he'll be the next Thanos for a misdirection, Kang himself is at once incredibly confusing and I'm sorry, very boring. Like, even his general design is just very Scandinavian minimalist furniture, you know? Oh, hey, another blue and or purple person in futuristic tunic with a hat that lets Kirby avoid having to draw ears. Cool. And his backstory is frustrating, I think would be the nice way to put it. Another way to put it would be, of course, comics are weird. See, Kang is basically a regular human-ish guy, more or less, with no special powers, but he's got a shitload of technology that's so advanced it's basically magic because he's a time traveler from the future, specifically the 31st century and then later, which, yes, sounds pretty optimistic, where he's conquered everything and he likes to zip back and forth into points in the past and make sure the future stays that way. At least that was the initial idea. He showed up as a one-off Avengers villain early on in the run when pretty much every Avengers nemesis was just a super powerful person who'd show up unannounced, challenge them, get beaten, and then leave to fight another day because the Avengers was an idea the publisher kind of forced on Stan Lee and company and it took them a while to figure out what they were actually supposed to do or be about. And if you're remembering, hey wait, doesn't any character, good or evil, having a time machine with zero defined usage limits break the universe? Like, even beyond the whole why not just come back every 30 seconds until the Avengers are just worn out from fighting in under an hour issue. After the report, we'll time travel back to two days ago, steal your dad's keys and leave them here. Where? I don't know. How about behind that sign? That way, when we get here now, they'll be waiting for us. See? Whoa, yeah! Well, that's how Kang became, if not interesting, at least useful as the Marvel Universe walking embodiment of what I like to call explainium, i.e. the opposite inverse of hand wavium, the shorthand for whichever mechanism a work of fiction deploys to skip past explaining either something impossible or a mistake in order to get back to the plot because that's the more interesting part of the story. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, whenever you notice something like that, a wizard did it. I see. All right, yes. But in episode AG4... Wizard. Ah, uh, for... Explainium is for the opposite situation, for when your story isn't original, or not very good, or your mistake actually was a mistake, and so instead of skipping ahead, you just try to bury it in convoluted, made-up sci-fi bullshit that sounds interesting, or even more convoluted mythos and lore connectivity that panders to fanboys by making them feel rewarded for recognizing all the references. I.e. when your editor says, wait, didn't we already do Thanos sends dinosaurs to kill Spider-Man, and then the writer says, no, 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 see, that time Thanos was using the Time Stone, to summon dinosaurs from prehistoric times, but this time he used the reality stone to create the dinosaurs he knew Spider-Man had seen in his childhood nightmares by using the Mind Stone. So you see, this is totally totally different story. So after some recurring appearances where it got fleshed out that Kang was actually just a history scholar from the 31st century who found out Doctor Doom invented time travel once, dug up the research, and used it to zip around the past, and set up an even further post-apocalyptic future where he could be a conqueror, Kang got repurposed as Marvel's retroactive time-traveling Scooby-Doo villain throughout the Silver and Early Bronze Age. Whenever Marvel wanted to revisit an old story and beef up its place in the mythos or just patch a hole in the continuity... <laughs> It was Kang all along. The Scarlet Centurion, that was Kang. And since he was revealed to have been the evil Egyptian pharaoh Ramatut, that was also Kang, despite having been introduced in the pages of a Fantastic Four comic a year before Kang's first appearance in the Avengers comic. Kang is also Immortus, though technically he's the even further into the future version of Kang that doesn't like Kang, and at one point, because of all the time-changing, there were many Kangs who were opposed to each other, 
Yeah, but Immortus is often thought to be the alpha dog of them since, you know, the name and he's got the big hat, right? Oh, he's also the father of Marcus, the interdimensional sleazeball who raped Carol Danvers in order to impregnate her with a clone of himself so he could be reborn in a human body and marry her. Yeah, that whole thing, that's also a Kang story. Great. So was the Celestial Madonna saga, which, you know what, I don't have the time or drugs to explain that thing here and I've got a sinking feeling that another project is going to make it necessary to explain it anyway in the near future. So for now, that was where Vision married Scarlet Witch, but it was a double wedding where Mantis also married a magic tree because she was going to give birth to vegan New Age Christ or something, and Immortus officiated. Right. I wish this was about sex. We loved each other. We had a child together. What? I conceived a child with million ants and it died inside me because it was half a million ants and half collapsing star! Oh yeah, he's also a random small-town Wisconsin mayor in 1901 named Victor Timely, who seeds Phineas Horton's mind with the plans to later create Jim Hammond, the original android version of the Human Torch during World War II. Oh hey, do you remember that you've already seen him in the MCU? What'd you tell her about me? Only the good stuff. Welcome to the Modern Marvels Pavilion and the World of Tomorrow. Ah, hell, now they got me doing it. And he's also Iron Lad, a teenage Kang from his original timeline, who figures out that he's going to grow up to be Kang the Conqueror. Oh, uh, did I not mention Kang, not his real name? Gee, that seems important. And decides he doesn't want to be a supervillain, so he's going to fix things by going back to the 21st century, dressing up like Tony Stark, and forming the teenage superhero cover band, the Young Avengers, in the wake of the first Civil War event. What's the matter, Pop? I'm confused. Okay, so the bad news is, Kang the Conqueror is kind of a dull character who makes everything more confusing, only exists to be confusing himself, and is only prominent in the first place because for a long time he was the only suitably noteworthy regular Avengers villain other than Ultron who belonged to the Avengers as a team, as opposed to being the nemesis of a specific hero who happened to also be an Avenger. The good news is, if this is true, that doesn't really matter because this is for the movies, Jonathan Majors is a good actor, and Marvel Studios totally reworks the villains from the ground up all the time. So a guy whose basic backstory and whole deal with all the other stuff, likely including the stupid hat stripped out, would still end up letting Marvel riff on an unlicensed evil version of the Doctor bouncing around their continuity causing trouble would have a lot of possibilities, not just as a bad guy to fight, but as a way to kick off and or resolve storylines, especially since, given that Avengers Endgame established that the MCU's version of time travel operates on an assumption of quantum multiverse branching mechanics rather than ripple effect, an MCU Kang would logically have to be capable of traversing dimensions as well as time. But speaking of ripple effects, one reason to cover these, admittedly just shy of clickbait casting stories, is, well, people watch these, frankly, but also because the way one role is cast can sometimes tell you how other roles are trending. Specifically, in the comics, Kang the Conqueror's real name is Nathaniel Richards. And since in superhero universes there's no such thing as coincidental name sharing... Save Martha! WHY DID YOU SAY THAT NAME?! IT'S HIS MOTHER'S NAME! Yes, at least the last time I was able to make coherent sense of his origins, Nathaniel Richards is meant to be the distant descendants of Reed Richards, Mr. Fantastic. <gasps> Bear in mind, this character is apparently meant to debut in Ant-Man 3, which is being directed by Peyton Reed. Now, somewhat famously, Peyton Reed was supposed to direct a Fantastic Four movie at Fox back in the 90s, but the studio ultimately turned down his take, which reportedly would have skipped the origin story and been a highly stylized period film set in the mid-1960s of the original comics and made the two Jessica Alba movies instead. And it's been rumored pretty much since the first Ant-Man did way more box office than anyone expected out of Ant-Man that Marvel had been considering having Reed take another shot once they got the property back, which they've now done. So if Majors, an African-American actor, is playing a character who's supposed to be related to the Richards family, traditionally depicted as white characters, we might have a big clue now as to how the MCU's take on the Fantastic Four might differ from the versions we've seen previously in literally every other medium. That would be a significant change, and kind of a big deal. One can only imagine what internet fandom cultures, calm, measured, thoughtful, forward-looking, and broadly considered take on the matter would be were it to come to pass. Right? And the abyss stares back ever deeper. I'm Bob, and that's the big picture. <laughs>